everybody, and thank you for coming this evening. Um, it's been a great thing today for everybody to be here. I have a couple of, of announcements that I want to make. First of all, I want to announce that Helen and Lynn Clark are celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary this week. And Patricia Smeri is celebrating a birthday today, I believe, or yesterday, so today. it's her birthday. Yay. Yay. Um, Joanne, can you do the um, the volunteer of the week or month now? Sure. Before everybody disperses and nobody knows who's who's, who's got what. <laughs> Yes, now uh, we. Oh, there she is. We did a volunteer of the month, and it is uh, Diane Haskell. So Diane's going to making herself real scarce, real fast here. She gets to dip into the bag and draw out a gift card for all the years and months of service that she comes in and does all the stuff and shows me all the loopholes and. And she got one for Giant Tiger. Oh, oh, yeah. Congratulations. Yes. And she might, I guess, has donated to the OGS trustee. She has signed it, donating it to us. Nice. Thank so you. So it'll be part of our class. Thank you very much. How do you say your last name? Moriyama. 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 Thank you very much. And um, while we're at it, if you want to send, we're going to send the calendar around. We desperately need volunteers up in the library, so yeah. if you have any free time and you want to donate, please sign the book, sign the calendar. Uh -huh. And we also need people to sign up for sweets and treats at the end of our programs. So if anybody wants to do any of that and you want to talk to somebody, talk to Joanne about it, okay? Yeah, because I have a little thing here, and I have been listening to your requests and concerns about snacks and treats and all that. So we discussed it at our meeting. I'm going to send this around. There's three choices. Either we supply snacks, you members that have been doing it, if you do, because of the Privacy Act, I do not have your phone numbers and your names, which I need. Or if uh, you want no snacks at all, and we just go with the coffee, tea, pop, and water, that's fine. Just pick it off because nobody's names are going on here unless it's snacks by members. Or if you just want me to pick them up every month, and we just won't bother trying to get people to come in and, or make plans, and then they end up being sick or whatever. Okay? Thank you. So I hope everybody will fill out the little chart, see what we're doing, and carry on from there. Anyway, once again, I want to welcome you to the Kent Branch OGS June meeting. It's um, being recorded, and you know we preserve and promote for over the last 50 years. We have 30 branches within Ontario. We are a general helper in family history. We do research for members that can, for our own members, for people who come into the library and from afar. So we try and hit everybody and anybody that's working in Kent County. We do a mentoring, we do assistance, we have a newsletter three times a year. We do have monthly meetings. It's uh, There's a few months that we don't meet though and um, we have a fabulous resource collection. If you've been up in the library lately, we've been doing a little bit of moving around and a little bit of changing things up, but it's Coming almost to an end now. Matt's almost got everything labeled and we'll be able to carry on from there. Um, this is our picture of our second floor where we have our library with our many books, our family histories and city directories, telephones, obituaries, vital statistics, whatever it is you're looking for, we have it. We also have a web page, a Facebook group, and they're both open to the public so anyone can join. Feel free to go on the web page or the Facebook page and join up. Um, <clears throat> Kent Branch did an April tour of the Chatham Kent Black Historical Society and it was really interesting. They had a half an hour uh, film clip that we watched and you'd be amazed what the rich history of, of the black history is within Chatham Kent. They were saying names and what they did and, and very prominent people within their own little community that they had at the time, and it's really, really an interesting slide if you ever get a chance to see it. Thank you. Um, 
If you're joining, now is the time to join because you'll get a membership for half price until the end of the year, which is always a nice thing for $37. So that's a big thing. Go to the OGS website if you want to in order to find out more about it. And our upcoming event, Sussex is going to do an OGS live stream. So if you want to go down next week and watch the live stream, you need to go to the Latter-day Saints Church down in, in, S in Windsor. And there's going to be different ones at each time of the, of the day, so you can go and see what we have. And you can carpool. Do you have anything to say on that? Yeah, so that's the uh, OGS conference. So while some of us are traveling to the conference in Ottawa next week, they're going to be live streaming some of the presentations uh, to the public. And that's going to be offered in, at the, the Essex branch is putting that on. It's free. There are some people traveling from here. So if you're interested, let us know. We'll try and get you up so you can carpool. And uh, June the 20th, the Canada Historical Society is going to have a history of the Chatham baseball with Fred Osman speaking about it. It's going to be at 7.30 at the Cultural Center, Studio One, and it's open to everybody. So this will be in, in another great venue to see if you want to go and see it. September is British Home Children. And we're going to co-host with the um, Chatham Ken Historical Society at the Cultural Center. So we won't be here that month. We'll be over in the other area. And uh, September is the British Home Child Month, so that's why we're honoring them. Um, Family History Fair. We're going to have a Family History Fair in September. We're going to have an open house, hopefully, that will show all the hard work and that Matt and different ones have volunteered throughout the this past, what, maybe six months now of refreshing, revitalizing, and redoing the, the library. So we just thought it would be a good time to, to do something like this along with the Chatham Kent Public Library is joining forces with an open house as well with us. Yeah, we're going to just on that, Judy, so that we partnered with the library and we've invited other organizations to come along. So there will be some historical societies, some museums, uh, the United Empire Loyalists will be there from Bicentennial Branch, um, uh, Buxton Museum, I think there's a couple of others. So as a whole, it's a, from 10 to 3, we're going to have a number of speakers, we're going to have some sessions showing people how to use Ancestry, showing people how to use Find My Past. Uh, we're going to um, hopefully get everyone around to visit all of the different organizations that are there. And so we're looking for A, your support, and B, we're looking for some volunteers to help staff our library while we've got our visitors in. Unfortunately, I think Matt will have be gone by then because so, he's yeah. going to be doing pursuing his master's degree. But uh, we will have, not hopefully, we will have a library that's completed. <laughs> everything full, in its place, everything looking with good. With a full inventory of everything <laughs> that's there, and that hasn't been totally done in a long time. So it's, it's, it'll all have a number on it, and we'll know where it's supposed to go. So it'll be a big help, along with tags saying where it's at. So uh, we've already talked about snacks for our monthly meetings. And tonight's presentation is going to be given by Goldie. So, well, not the presentation, the introduction to the presentation. Uh, is that better? Well, Matt, well, you sure is. Is if it? she wants to give it, I'm fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> like, Here's Goldie. <laughs> Go, Goldie. <laughs> so, I'm pleased to have the honor to introduce tonight's guest speaker, Ann Fisher. Ann is a retired OPP officer, as is her husband. Brian. Brian. Yeah, Brian. Yeah. They have three children, and because of their careers, they've lived in various places in Ontario. The most recent couple, I think, being Glenham and now St. Thomas. Now, we all know that police officers are supposed to be physically fit, right? Well, Anne proved she was definitely physically fit about six years ago. She took on the undertaking of her lifetime. Uh, to bring attention to impaired drivers, she bicycled from Vancouver, BC to Sydney, Nova Scotia. Wow. <laughs> and that was throughout right now you were on your journey six years ago, June, uh, July, and August, right? Okay. And she created a blog of this journey and it's still online. Anne's Ride Across Canada. And it's quite interesting to read. 
Now, I first became aware of Anne about five years ago, I'm thinking. There was an article in Chatham this week that featured a big picture of Dr. Jim Allen. And that sure grabbed my attention because I used to volunteer for him in his orthopedic clinics. So, of course, I read the article. And in that, it was mentioned that Anne was the webmaster of a site called ckphysiciantribute.ca where she had uh, put tributes to the various doctors who had spent some time in Kent County and Chatham, you know, servicing the patients here. So this project was funded by the Howard J. Reese Foundation, and Anne is the president of that foundation now. Dr. Reese actually was her stepfather. Anyway, I found the article so intriguing and very informative in terms of historical information and genealogical information. So I contacted her to see if I could get her permission to make hard copies from the uh, information posted on her website. And she agreed, and thus we ended up with our binder in the OGS room of CK Physician. So to date, she's had over 400 tributes posted. Now, obviously, Anne spends many, many volunteer hours in this project, researching the doctors, interviewing them and their family if they're still alive and available, um, visiting grave sites, checking out census, a lot of newspaper articles, and then writing the biography for the individual doctors. So there have been some interesting doctors practiced in this community. So please help me welcome Anne as she discusses her project and some of the stories of the doctors. Well, first of all, let me thank you all very much for inviting me here today and uh, listening to my presentation. Um, I wasn't nervous uh, until I saw that Reverend Moriyama, Mar Moriyama was here because she was my English teacher in grade nine <laughs> at Southern District High School. So now I'm like really nervous I'm going to say something that's going to be wrong. So just, go, just go over and give her a hug. I know, I just that would be good. That's a while ago. <laughs> so anyway, thank you very much for having me here. And I, I'm happy to sort of share what I know about the Chatham Camp Physician Tribute website. Work on the Chatham Camp Physician Tribute website began in 2008. The official launch of the website was at a ceremony at the Chatham Camp Health Alliance Library when the Howard J. Reese Learning Center was unveiled on the 16th of January 2009. The foundation had donated some money uh, to the Chatham Camp Health Alliance and they uh, basically named the computer lab in the library that's at the Chatham Camp Health Alliance. They named it after Howard. Uh, when the website was officially launched, it had about 25 doctors on the site, and today there are 405 doctors on our website. Any doctor that has served in Kent County is eligible to be included on the website. Some of the doctors on the site have a short tenure in Kent County, and many died very young, others moved on. The Howard G. Reese Foundation maintains the cost of the website. And like Goldie said, I volunteer my time to research and write the biographies for the website. And my husband will tell you that sometimes it comes between me and my senses. Sometimes it's like so compelling, you just have to keep going as you probably all know and want to get on to something. Whenever possible, I do try to speak to the doctor or to a family member to gather information and verify accuracy. Uh, we do not use Ouija boards, in case you were wondering. <laughs> some of our doctors are quite old and have been gone a long time. When I was putting together this PowerPoint presentation, I was reviewing the doctors, and I believe the oldest doctor on the website is Dr. John Humphrey, and he served in Duart. He was born in England in 1774. Sometimes a family member will contact me, and I'm very grateful for any information I can add to the doctor's biography. And a lot of the times I hear about the personal impact that the doctor's life has on his family. A lot of times they're giving up time with their family to be with a sick patient. Mrs. Leslie Winter contacted me in November of 2014. She lives in the state of Wyoming and said that she had a pencil sketch of her husband's great grandfather, Dr. Hugh Edwin Winter. And I'm going to show you a picture of him. I just have to find out which button I'm to push. The right one. The right one. Right. Pointed at the computer. Oh, pardon me. 
Ah, there he is. Now, the pixelation, of course, is a little distorted for you, but this was taken through a piece of glass hanging on the wall of Mrs. Winter's house, and she didn't want to take it apart, fearing the condition of the portrait. But anyway, on the website, it looks a, a little bit clearer. She did not have any extra information, by the way, to add to uh, Dr. Winter. This is Howard. Uh, this is his biography. This is his page. Um, a very interesting, fascinating man. He practiced in Blenheim for over 40 years. Um, Howard never married, and he had no children of his own. And for 40 years until his retirement, Howard tended to the patients of the Blenheim and the Kent County area day and night. He formed the Howard J. Reese Foundation in 1987 with a purpose to promote arts, education, and health and welfare. His generosity began long before the foundation. He used to donate uh, money anonymously to the Public General Hospital or to the St. Joseph's Hospital. It just seemed that they needed a piece of equipment um, in the surgeries. He would donate the money anonymously, and the next thing you know, the physicians were able to use it in, this, in the surgeries. Howard died on the 9th of February, 2010, but the Howard J. Reese Foundation lives on. Through the foundation, swimming lessons are provided free of charge each year to grade, uh, students in grade three and four at all Blenheim schools, and he's, we've done this for years. The foundation has provided generous donations to the Chatham-Kent Hospice, the Chatham-Kent Health Alliance, the Talbot Trail Par Place Park, the Blenheim Senior Center, the Golden Eagles Gymnastics Club, the Mary Webb Center in Highgate, and each year high, uh, scholarships are presented to graduating students in Kent County. The thing about Howard was he was very happy to, he was very happy to donate his money. He just didn't want the accolades that came with it. When they were um, um, to, uh, when we were at the library and they were going to um, dedicate the library making it the Howard J. Reese Learning Center. We were wheeling Howard in in his wheelchair, and this was in 2009, he died in 2010. And uh, we were wheeling him in, and he just kind of motioned over to me. So I leaned in and I said, yes, Howard. I said, aren't you thrilled? You know, all these people are here for you. Do you mind if we name the library after my mother? Wow. <laughs> you know, Howard, the plaques on the wall. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, that's the type of guy that he was. Oh, I know. Um, <laughs> Jesse James and Frank James, bad guys, as you know. And then, of course, Cole Younger and his two brothers, they're all bank robbers. At one time, though, Jesse James and the Cole Younger boys all joined up and they were robbing banks together. Dr. George Henry Overholt was born on the 7th of March, 1842, near Beamsville, Ontario. He graduated from university in about 1866, and where does he happen to be practicing right after that? In Wheatley, Ontario. And he was there from 1866 to 1870, and then he moved to Winnipeg at one time, and then he moved on to Medalia, Minnesota. Well, guess who robbed a bank nearby in Northfield, Minnesota? Yes, that's right, the Cole Younger and the Jesse James gang. Guess who was part of the posse that went after these guys? Yes, that's right. That would be Dr. George Overholt. On September 7, 1876, Jesse James and the Younger Brothers robbed the Northfield, Minnesota First National Bank. Days later, they were spotted in Medalia, and a posse was organized. And, of course, that would be the guy that ran the mercantile and perhaps a sheriff or two. And and a couple of others. There's about six or seven of them. And I'm going to go to the next one. That's actually his biography that does appear on the Chatham Kent Physician Tribute website. But there's our posse. And the, this photo was actually, I obtained it out of a book called Robert and Hero, the story of the Northfield Bank Raid by George Huntington. And it was published in 1999. Anyway, one of those fellows is Dr. Overholt. I don't know which one. I know the fellow with the beard is not him. Any of the others could be Dr. Overholt. Anyway, the posse sets out, right? And now there's this lake, and they have to get over the lake. They know that the younger brothers and Jesse James and his brother are on the other side of this lake. 
So the posse splits up. They're trying to find a short way, a short way across this lake or over this lake or around this lake to go get the bad guys. So half the posse goes off this way and half the posse goes off that way. And the half of the posse that has Dr. Oakhold in it comes upon the younger boys, the three of them. And shots are exchanged. And Dr. Overholt actually struck the walking stick that Cole Younger was using. And apparently Cole Younger turned and fired a shot at Dr. Overholt. It hit his uh, the, uh, the, the watch. pocket watch. Thank you. Uh, something about a charm too, I remember them saying. But anyway, pocket watch charm. Anyway, and it deflected off and he was not hurt. Cole Younger and his brothers were taken into custody. Jesse James at that time was not taken into custody. Anyway, um, the only part of the story that I cannot verify I'm kind of, uh, is the part where he, uh, Dr. Overholt was struck. But I can verify that George Overholt did shoot towards Cole Younger and take out his walking stick. So that part does appear in, my, in the biography for Dr. Overholt. But the part about him being struck in the um, pocket watch, I have not put in there because I only have one source and I could not verify that. Anyway, he was taken into custody. And when he was taken into custody, he was injured. So um, he um, had to be treated by Dr. Overholt. The same man that he's firing shots at now is expecting to get some medical care. And anyway, that's that story. So this is the gun that was removed from Cole Younger, and it's got some other Joe's name on it. It's got JK, and it's engraved on the butt strap of the gun. So obviously he's swiped this gun, killed the guy, whatever he's done. And that's the gun that was removed from him by Dr. Overholt and his posse. Interesting, huh? Yeah. Okay, so moving on. And now we have the Donnelly's tombstone. They, are, of course, are buried at St. Patrick's Church uh, on Roman Line near Lupin. That's where the Donnellys are buried. And um, on the night of February the 4th, 1880, a vigilante group went after the Donnellys, killed five members of the Donnelly family in Badolf Township. Dr. C.W., it's Christopher William Flock, did all the autopsies. And, of course, Dr. O Dr. Um, Flock ended up moving to, um, it says he, he practiced in the Wheatley area, which he did, but he actually lived in Leamington. And Leamington's only about 12 kilometers down the road. They truly were doctors without borders at the time. He was often in Romney Township. His name appears on numerous birth records and death records and in the Wheatley area as well. But the man that performed the... Um, the autopsy on the Donnellys ended up on our website. And uh, they ended up moving, I think. They were in uh, Leamington from 1882 to 1885, and then they ended up moving to the St. Thomas area. Any questions or anything so far? Is there, is there any? Okay. Yeah. You wanted to explain why the flag? Oh, yeah, thank you so much. The Donnellys had a new stone. Did you have that? Pardon me? The Donnellys have a new stone? They've had several stones over the year, and you probably know that people keep going and chipping off um, souvenirs from the tombstones, so that is a, a fairly new one. They've had two or three at least. There's one after that one. Is it fairly Another new? one after that one again. It's more modern. Is it? Yeah. Um, now, this is the page that does appear on the Chatham Kent Physician Tribute website for Dr. Flaw. There's a Canadian flag here because I cannot find a picture of Dr. Flock yet, and I cannot find a tombstone. So if I can't find either the tombstone of the doctor or a picture photograph of the doctor, I put a Canadian flag up. There are 54 Canadian flags on the site, and there's 405 doctors. So 351 of them either have a photograph or they have a tombstone. But that's what I do in regards to if I can't find a photograph of the doctor. Thanks, Mark. Okay, this uh, actually has been supplied to me by Goldie Howe. She, uh, every time she comes across some uh, interesting tidbits that she, when she's going through some of the microfiche at the Chatham Library, it ends up in my mailbox, and I'm very grateful for Goldie for all she does for me. Um, this is the story of Dr. James Cook Bright. He was born in Ohio in 1820. 
and he was certified to practice medicine in Ontario in 1869, but there's evidence that he was practicing in Chatham as, as uh, early as 1866. His address was 39 King Street West, that was his home and his office, and that property is now located across from Retro Suites, it's that park that was there. And the property, it was a four-story brick building. It burnt to the ground on November the 16th, 1881. It was uh, gutted by fire. And um, he rebuilt between 1882 and 1884. And he built uh, an opera house as well as an office space for his medical practice. On the 27th of May, 1887, Dr. Bright was arrested and charged with murder. He uh, performed an abortion on a young lady that traveled from Hamilton to Chatham for this abortion. She died of an infection. He was uh, arrested and he was charged with murder. Um, he was held in custody while he was in while he was on trial. This lady died May the 27th. He was arrested shortly thereafter. He was found not guilty according to the October 14, 1887 edition. Uh, in the local chat and paper that also will be provided for me. It announced that Dr. Bright had been acquitted by a jury on the 12th of October. Um, this is the, uh, this is what his uh, biography looks like on the website. Um, and I'll come back to this in just a minute, but you'll kind of want to take a little notice of the tombstone that's on there because it's not his. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, tragedy did not end with Dr. Bright's arrest for murder. He married a woman by the name of Susanna Williams Ogilvie. So I think she'd been married once before because she brought a 16-year-old daughter to the marriage with her. Um, at the time of their marriage, they were married in Detroit. Uh, Dr. Bright was 65 years old and Mrs. Bright was 40 years old. And I cannot find any indication that he had been married before. Um, and it, at the time, she had apparently had been living in Chicago, Illinois. The tr um, Mrs. Bright died on the 21st of October, 1888, of a morphine overdose that was self-inflicted. Um, she was, um, you got to remember that a month after they were married, he was arrested uh, for, the, uh, for murder. So, and then there was a long period of time from May to October that he was not earning any money because he was incarcerated. So anyway, Mrs. Bright, um, uh, and again, the day after she died, there was an inquest that was held at the town hall uh, in Chatham. Now you have to realize that when inquests are called now, they're like many months after the event, but this is almost like the next day that the inquest started. It became apparent that Mrs. Bright had become mentally unstable. Their witnesses testified to that effect. Dr. James P. Rutherford, who's also on our site, he was summoned to try, and he did give her an antidote, but it was to no avail. She did die. And she was buried at the uh, Maple Leaf Cemetery. And um, at the conclusion, it was determined that uh, Dr. Bright had nothing to do with his wife's death, and uh, she had died at her own hands. Uh, four years after Mrs. Bright died, uh, Dr. Bright died. And Who was she before her. she married Bright? Her name was Susanna Williams Ogilvy. Ogilvy? Ogilvy. Yeah. <coughs> go back? Yes. Okay. So the tombstone I mentioned is not Dr. Bright's. Do you, you're probably familiar with that area of the cemetery. It was like an occasional limestone <coughs> tombstone with vast areas that there's nothing. And this is where Susanna Bright's tombstone is. And there is no sign of Dr. James Cook Bright anywhere near where she was. And he only died like four years after she died. So it should be in the same proximity. So her tombstone is on the same place because it does relate to Dr. Bright. So I thought it was better than that. All right. This sweet young face is a young man that enlisted in World War One. He is 16 years old and doesn't he look it. He was born in Blenheim on the 1st of September <coughs> 1900. He enlisted on the no on November the 28th 1916 so he's 
coming up on 17, but he's still 16 years old. He, of course, said that his birth date was 1898, not 1900. So, of course, they took him out of Perhaps his mother signed off on it. I don't know. But all I know is he did serve in France with the 24th Regiment, the 63rd Battalion, as a gunner. <laughs> so he's serving his country. Uh, he survived. He came home. And he died in 1932. So you're, you see he's dying a young man as it is. He went on in 1927. He went to New York. And he... Uh, was studying surgery. He's already graduated <coughs> from the University of Toronto in 1927. He goes on to further his studies in New York. He meets a sweet young lady from Ridgetown, Ontario, who was also in New York studying art. And her name was Delmarion Thumb. That is her name. And they get married. And uh, they were married in 1928, as you can see. And they had a little boy born on November, not November 8th, 1930. That little boy's name is John Thumb Rutherford. Anyway, uh, Dr. Rutherford collapsed at his office around 9 p.m. on the 4th of January 1932 and he died. He was buried at the Blenheim Evergreen Cemetery. One other doctor on our website also um, altered his age to enlist in World War I and that uh, man's name is Oral Shillington. Oral Bentley Shillington. He also misrepresented his age. He was born in 1899, but he stated his birthday was 1898. And he also uh, served in World War I. I keep uh, lots of lists on the go. These lists are not part of the website. They're just part of my computer. These are all the doctors that I have on our website that have served in World War I. Anything with a GOH beside it means that they also appear on the Gathering Our Heroes website. Jerry Hind and I uh, e uh, share information back and forth. He'll find a doctor for me that I don't have on my site. I'll find a doctor for him that he doesn't have on his site. So we work quite closely exchanging information. Um, there is one name that should be at the very top of this list. Uh, it's Dr. George Atchison. He served in World War I. His son served in World War I, and his daughter served in World War I as a nurse. And all three were in France. Dr. George Atchison, it's the only name that's not on the list that should be on the list. Dr. Henry Summers Bar Barlow, you might know Dr. Blake Barlow. Uh, he's still living in Chatham. That's his father. Uh, Dr. Blake Barlow and his three brothers all served in World War II. And Dr. Henry Summers Barlow actually lost one of his sons. December 4th, 1944, uh, his son Keith died. Dr. Blake Barlow's brother was killed in action uh, in 1944. Murray Hume Patterson, the alphabetical, he's right there. He died in World War I. He was 27 years old when he died. He was a decorated war hero. He was a physician serving in World War I. His father lived on Stanley Ave here in Chatham. And he um, went into no man's land on more than one occasion, at least two, and brought prisoners uh, back that had been injured, not prisoners, sorry, uh, their uh, fellow um, military personnel, brought them back to the, um, where they needed to get first aid. And uh, he was uh, given the military cross by King George V. Uh, he was sent home because he was injured as well. He was sent home to convalesce. There was a big party for him here in Chatham. Um, news articles are, 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 around, are at the, uh, around microfiche about Dr. Patterson. He went back in 1917. He was going to be redeployed, uh, but there's um, evidence that he suffered from PTSD and he walked out in front of a train and he was killed on the 15th of September, 1917. He is buried in uh, Surrey, England, I believe. Um, kind of sad today. Uh, there's my World War II doctors. Uh, again, the GOH. And you'll see some also served in World War I. And on the previous slide, my World War I doctors also mm -hmm. had time uh, serving in World War II. Sometimes they'd, they'd moved to the United States, and now they're serving for the United States military. Um, Um, there's only one woman on my lists of World War I and World War II who served, a physician who served, 
with the Canadian military. And that is this lady, Dr. Lois Pierce. She was an amazing woman, as you probably have some familiarity with Lois. She only died in 2014, lived forever here in Chatham with her husband, Dr. Lois Pierce. Anyway, um, she served with the Canadian Women's yeah. Uh, Canadian Army, the, hang on a second, Canadian Women's Army Corps? Army Corps, yeah. Canadian Women's Army Corps, thanks, Brian. Um, I looked it up on Wikipedia. It basically says that it's a non-combat branch of the Canadian Army, established during World War II. Most women's, women served in Canada, but some served overseas, <coughs> and they basically released men in mechanics positions, secretarial positions, so that they could go into combat, and they were uh, part of a non-combat group. So she, uh, anyway, she was in med school when she signed up for the Canadian Women's Army Corps. Um, the other interesting fact about Dr. Pierce and her husband is they walked across Canada when she was 69 years old. She went from Vancouver to Halifax. I talked to her daughter, Margaret. Uh, Margaret worked in the library at the Chatham Kent Health Alliance. And I did not actually, she was one of the first 25 that went on. We had a summer student in 2008 who was doing the first 25, kind of getting them organized uh, for the Chatham Kent position and website. And uh, anyway, I did speak to Margaret afterwards and she said her mom and dad left in the snow and they returned in the snow. So they walked for eight and a half months across Canada. They were raising awareness for um, the polio campaign for Rotary and they would do different speaking engagements along the way. An amazing woman. Okay, um, this is Dr. Susanna Carson. She's not on the website because <laughs> she did not practice in Kent County, but her sister did. Her sister is Dr. Jenny Carson. Jenny Carson is on the website. And Jenny is actually the elder of the two girls. An amazing feat because they were in med school in uh, 1888. So Dr. Susanna Carson graduated from Trinity Medical, and her, her older sister Jenny graduated the, a year later. Jenny came to Kent County and practiced with Dr. James Duncan. And um, Susanna, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about her because her story is so fascinating. She married a fella in Newberry by the name of Peter Reinhardt. And her sister Jenny was a witness at her ma at her wedding, and they became Susanna and Peter became missionaries in China and Tibet. In 1897, uh, she and her husband, with their infant son Charles, uh, moved to Tibet. They were moving in 1898. They were moving further inland to a place called Lhasa with their 10-month-old son. Three guides, many horses, enough food for a year, and 500 New Testaments. The trip was a nightmare from beginning to end. The Reinhardt's baby died. They were attacked by robbers, and their guides deserted. On the 26th of September, um, <coughs> Peter spied an encampment of nomads across a river, went to seek their help, and Susanna never saw him again. For three days, she waited with her revolver in her lap. Two months after falling in with some truly wicked men, those are her words, uh, she reached other missionaries in the Sichuan province. Um, she returned to Chatham in 1900. Her health was broken and her hair had turned white by her ordeal. She wrote a book and it's available online. It's called With the Tibetans in Tent and Temple. It was published in 1901. She returned to missionary work in Tibet, God love her, in 1902. She married a fellow missionary by the name of James Moyes. And anyway, they continued to do missionary work. In 1907, she found out she was pregnant again. She came home to Chatham because she was pregnant. And guess who delivered her baby? Jenny. Jenny. That's right. Sadly, the baby died in a month. And Susanna died shortly thereafter. Susanna is actually buried in Chatham, and so was the baby. Jenny Carson, she went on and she eventually moved to Vancouver, and she died in 1933. 
Anyway, Jenny Carson is on the website. And remember the name James Duncan because that's who took her in and showed her the intricacies, you know, following her medical training. This is the lovely Bessie Cathcart, who served for many, many years. I think she retired in 1966, but she served in uh, Wallsburg. And I spoke to her granddaughter, and I met her granddaughter in the cemetery at Wallsburg. She was tending her father's grave, and that would be Bessie's son's grave. And anyway, I spoke to Patricia, and she supplied the photograph. She said how wonderful it was to see her grandmother's story online. She views it regularly, I can tell by the analytics. Anyway, she told me that when Bessie Cathcart went to the University of Toronto Medical School, she started there in 1910. She said she played dumb to get along with all the other fellows in her class. Um, anyway, she was not the one to sort of say, hey, look at me. She just got along, she graduated, and she married one of her classmates, oh. Dr. William Cathcart. And the two of them set up their, uh, their practice in Wallaceburg. They had two children, a boy and a girl, Ramona and Rona. And unfortunately, Dr. Cathcart, uh, probably one of the first vehicles on the road anyway, he died in a car accident in 1933. She never remarried. She served her patients well. Uh, there are nurses in Wallaceburg who have nothing but wonderful things to say about Bessie Cathcart. She's buried in the McDonald Cemetery in uh, Sombra, next to her husband. This story um, is all about Isaac Brown, but on the website he appears as Samuel Russell. This uh, biography was written by Brian Prince. Uh, who does a lot, you know, in uh, Buxton with his wife, Shannon. And I've been out there a few times. They've been very helpful with some of the doctors of color that do appear on the website. A horrible story for poor Isaac. He was accused of um, shooting his owner. Uh, anyway, he fled before they could arrest him. He had been whipped severely on more than one occasion prior to the shooting. He was able to get to Canada. Eventually, his wife, and I think there was nine children, uh, moved to Canada as well. His overseer and his owner did come to Canada, did uh, petition the Canadian government. There's a warrant for this man's arrest for shooting me. Please give him back to me. Of course, you knew what's going to happen to the poor guy. And the government of Canada said, mm -mm, no, thank you. Off you go. And he stayed in Canada. He changed his name. He took a freedom name of Samuel Russell. And that's the name that does appear on the website. I think if you Google, if you check with the Isaac Brown, it probably will come up too. But he's Samuel Russell, served for many years in Chatham. Uh, the final notice that you can sort of that I have found in the Kent Gazetteer for Samuel Russell is 1864 to 1865. But the entire biography that does appear online. No. Anyway, the th entire biography for Samuel Russell or Isaac Brown was written by Brian um, Prince. And he also uh, is included in Brian's book. It's called One More River to Cross. It was published in 2012. Joseph Campbell, I'm um, just going to kind of, I just have a few kind of like interesting little bits, tidbits. And I'm not going to go too much into Joseph Campbell. Obviously, I don't have a photograph or a tombstone of Joseph Campbell. I guess the sad part is right here in this paragraph here, uh, they had six children. Uh, in November of 1887, they lost five of them to diphtheria. They were left with a 10-year-old daughter, Maud. That was it. Six kids and actually they lost two children on one day. So we won't stop there too long. He was actually, I'll, I'll continue, his service location is Thamesville. He lived in Florence, but as you know, you can see Florence just across the bridge there, when you're standing in Kent County, there's Florence. So he serviced Camden Township, Dawn Township, Euphemia Township, and uh, Thamesville. So he is included on our website, even though he didn't live here. Anybody recognize Dr. John Ruddle? Yes. Dresden, that's right. In a letter written by Dr. Ruddle to the University of Western Ontario Alumni Gazette in 1978, he wrote, Dr. Ruddle incidentally died in 1979. He graduated from the University of Western Ontario in 1933. 
uh, started his practice in Dresden in 1934. He wrote, though, to the Gazette just before he died, the past 44 years have been mostly happy, but I cannot forget the time when I spent all night in my car stuck in the snow drift during a blizzard or the night my car was stuck in the mud. It was dark and raining and I walked a mile with mud and water to my knees to attend a lady having a miscarriage. She survived and I received no pay. Before country roads were graveled, there was also a time that I got stuck in the gumbo clay of Dawn Township so badly the front tires of my car would not even rotate. Another doctor that's on our website is called Dr. James Sanson. He did not believe in sending bills to his patients. He basically said that if they can afford to pay me, they'll pay me what they can. And if they can't afford to pay me, what's the point of sending them a bill? He was not very popular with his other physicians. You said he was Dr. Sampson? Samson with an M. Yeah, he was my doctor when I was little. Was he James Sampson? Yeah, he, he died in Florida, actually. He, uh, he was for many years, though, in Chatham and in Blenheim. Mm -hmm. And this is Dr. Charles Baird Oliver. And there is so much stuff that's available on microfiche. And Goldie has forwarded all kinds of good stuff on Dr. Charles Baird Oliver. He was such a philanthropist. He was donating money. He was donating his time. And he donated his blood to a baby that needed a blood transfusion in 1933. And he died in 1933. He was already in poor health. The baby in Merlin needed the blood. And he you'll never, and, pardon me? He also delivered that. And he delivered that baby as well. That's correct. And he, um, okay. he's not in good health. He's donating the blood to the baby. No, I was going to say something else, but anyway, I'll, I'll go. Oh, the and then and then the baby. Yes, I'll get to the baby in two seconds. But I had the biography on the website for quite a while. And all I could tell you was that he gave this baby the blood. He was in poor health. And then Dr. Oliver died. I had no idea who the baby was. Then I'm interviewing another doctor. And he said, Ann, he says, I see you have Dr. Charles Baird Oliver on your website. And I'm going, oh. Oh, yes, I said, he donated blood, and he died. He said, I was the baby that received the blood, and this is who I was interviewing. Oh, Dr. John. Dr. John Rowe received the blood from Dr. Charles Oliver. So, next time I see him, I'll talk to him. There you go. There you go. Yeah. And it's that, you know, and his uh, biography is also on the site. Dr. Uh, John Rowe practiced OBGYN in Chatham from 1963 to 2005. Now he's happily retired. Now you're wonder, maybe wondering which doctor, through the analytics, is viewed the most. And it would be this fella. Yeah. Goldie's friend, that's right, Dr. James Frederick Allen. His uh, family is quite frequently on the website. Um, there's at least 30 or 40 hits a month just for Dr. Dr. Allen. Uh, he died in January of 2004. His plane was taking off from Keeley Island, and it crashed, and everybody on board was killed. And I had a lovely conversation with his wife. She provided all of the information. And she also had the final approval about what went on. They kind of go back and forth. If there's a doctor's family, that's what I like to do, is give them the final say as to what goes on the website. He is not the only physician on the website that died in a plane crash. Dr. Clyde McAllister also is on our website. And he died in a plane crash in... He was born in 1895, and he died in, sorry, honey? Fort Wayne, Indiana. Yes, he had moved to Fort Wayne, Indiana, but he served uh, in Ridgetown. His father, his father was a Methodist minister, so they tended to move around a little bit. He was born in Brownsville. Uh, the family lived in, in Blenheim in 1911, and then the, uh, his father had moved to Ridgetown, and when Dr. McAllister finished med school, he practiced in Ridgetown. And then eventually they moved to Fort Wayne, Indiana in 1927. And anyway, he was killed in this car accident, or this uh, plane crash in 19-something. 1951, April the 28th, he was killed in this plane crash. And sadly, for Dr. McAllister, the picture I have, I haven't got a, his, his slides here, it's a childhood photo. He's like four years old. Oh, wow. That's all I have, so that's what's up there. 
And going kind of on the theme of crashes, we actually had a doctor that was killed in this uh, uh, train wreck in 1906 near Sudbury. His name is Dr. William Henry Millen, and he was in Wheatley. That's where he practiced, and I think he actually uh, did live in Wheatley and practiced in Romney Township. He was there for five years, I believe, uh, 1895 till 1900. He was in uh, Wheatley and he was killed in this train accident. There was 12 people that were killed in it. Almost to the end. Uh, there's quite a few groups uh, on our website. This is Dr. Tecumseh Kingsley Holmes and his three sons. They were all, they call it the, uh, the Holmes Dynasty. All three sons practiced in uh, Kent County. And Dr. Tecumseh Holmes was a very famous man. They built a huge home on King Street and uh, for many years. We also have a grandfather, father, and son that practiced in Chatham. That would be the Charterises ending up with Dr. Richard Charteris. He died in 2004, but his father and his grandfather also practiced in Chatham. We have a mother and daughter. We have Dr. Emir Dudley, who continues to practice in Wallaceburg. Her mother was a family physician in Ireland, Dr. Agatha Giltonen. And we have a brother and sister, Dr. Mary Louisa Agar, kind of interesting. Her and her brother both graduated from the University of Toronto in 1890. They set up their practice initially in Dover Township, and then they moved into Chatham. In the 1891 census, Dr. Mary Louisa Agar's occupation is listed as doctress. Oh, doctress. Doctress. I've only ever seen it the once, and it was for her. And of course, her brother was listed as a doctor. <coughs> and she's a doctress. Isn't that funny? I know. And then we have father and daughter. We had Dr. James Henry Duncan. Uh, his daughter, Jean, also became a, dun a doctor. And remember I told you that Jenny Carson practiced with Dr. James Duncan. So obviously he was very accepting of women in the medical <coughs> profession at a time when they weren't always accepted. And his daughter went on to become a physician as well. In the political arena, we have this gentleman here. It's Dr. Robert Thomas McGinnis. He practiced in Dresden. He was there in 1866. They resided at a home at um, Hugh Street, 396 Hugh Street. He served as a village councillor and a reeve. And then they moved to um, New Westminster about 10 years later in British Columbia. He was elected mayor of New Westminster in 1877. Sir John A. Macdonald appointed him to the Senate in December 4th of 1881. And the uh, tombstone that's what appears on our, um, on our website is of Dr. John Bell. He practiced in Berlin and he practiced in Bothwell. But when he was living in Merlin, he had a rousing liberal rally on his front yard, and the Honorable Mackenzie King attended and gave a rousing speech. And of course, he became the future, he was the future Prime Minister of Canada, but at the time, he was the Minister of Labor. This is Dr. George Archer Tye. He had five siblings. He was born in uh, Wiltshire, England. All five siblings, boys and girls, have the middle name of Archer. They just all have the same middle name. I thought that was kind of interesting. This fellow here is Dr. John Golden. The important thing about Dr. Golden, he was born in 1843, but that's not the important part. The important part is he was born on May the 31st. He, his wife was born on May the 31st. <coughs> I guess which day they got married on. <laughs> 31st of May. So, and that's also my daughter's birthday. Isn't that funny? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And his mother's name was Annie Black. His father was John Golden as well. So Black Golden, mm -hmm. the color mm -hmm. thing. That's why I put that on mm -hmm. Dr. Peter Nicholas Davy, uh, is, that's his tombstone. He is buried in Dewart. He's a twin, and he married a twin. They did not have twins. And this is Dr. William Albert Kelly. He did not live in Kent County. He lived in Florence, but of course he practiced, delivered babies, and attended patients in, um, in Kent County. He put an ad in the Florence Quill newspaper, which my friend Goldie forwarded to me, and the ad read, lost on Saturday, March the 14th, uh, this is in 1904, one stethoscope, somewhere between the 16th and the 21st side road, or on the 9th or the 10th concession of Dawn Township, Finder, 
please leave it at Dr. Kelly's office at once. <laughs> <laughs> he was on horse and buggy in those days. That's 1904. He did not get his first vehicle until 1911. So he was horse and buggy and he always got his folks on there. So this is my name. I've got all kinds of business cards up here. So if you are on our website and you find that there's a doctor that you have information on, a photograph of, um, that you think I could use or, or if I could you know, speak to somebody, please take one of my business cards or if you'd like to see your family physician on the website, I'd be happy to come down and speak to them. And like I say, they have final say what goes on, what doesn't go on. Some don't want their birth dates on. Some don't want, you know, ex-wives on, whatever. So we just sort of leave it up to the individual what they want on. So I've got uh, some pamphlets here on the Dr. Howard J. Hughes Foundation, and my business cards are there. So if you have anything for me, like please feel free to give me a call. I'm kind of ending with that. It's just kind of a little comic-y thing. But my friend Rosie, over the years, has printed off 405 doctors and put them in this lovely binder. And whenever I am at the genealogical society at the library, inevitably one of you wonderful volunteers comes out and, you know, we'll kind of smile at each other and you'll say, what are you working on? I'm saying a doctor's biography. Notoriously, you go into that little office there and you bring this out to me. And I am so grateful that you all seem to know what it is and, you know, offering your assistance to me. This past winter, I have gone over each and every one of my doctors, and I'm hoping Mrs. Uh, Reverend Moriyama does not, Margaret Moriyama does not look at this because there are spelling mistakes in here. <laughs> so I have gone over everything. I have fixed the grammar, and I have, I would like to present new binders to you that the Howard J. Reese Foundation has paid to have printed off <coughs> and down. So I have. Doctors M to Z here, and doctors A to L here, they're all fixed up. New information is on. Um, some of these doctors are, you know, have been on seven or eight years, and new stuff has been added. Photographs have been added, tombstones have been added, whatever I can add. So these are the up-to-date models. So I don't know what you want to do with Goldie's lovely book there that they have it. Yeah. <laughs> Branch OGS, I want to thank you for your donation to our oh. library because it's uh, it's an ongoing thing that, like yes. genealogy, it never ends, right? That's right. So, so in another seven years, I'll be back with fresh binders. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's our, our meeting for this evening. Help yourself to coffee and treats and a little chit-chat with each no, other, and I hope you had a good evening. <laughs>